Lieutenant Governor, thank you for taking the time. Yeah, happy to be here. Uh, we learned this afternoon that the Department of Health will not be prioritizing people for vaccinations based on their occupation, but instead based on their age, underlying health conditions, geography. I know you had been a big advocate for getting teachers prioritized. Were you disappointed in the decision not to elevate people based on their jobs? Well, first, uh, uh, Nicole, Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott, we've been meeting really regularly, which has been good in the last week, along with uh, uh, the General Callahan, Chris Callahan. So I think it's good that actually in the in the in the response today that uh, that we were talking about teachers. So um, when we did the data, I think it's 58 percent of the teachers are are in that catch basin, right? That catchment basin. So that that's going to be good. And then almost two thirds of the of teachers that are K through three. So I think this is a really good start. And what my point was that, um, and, 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 uh, and I said it you know, more, more than once was, this is not for teachers to step over seniors who have age and other uh, health uh, conditions, right? That, that we, you know, are very clear about that. But we know that the, um, the, the vaccines are going to come to our state quicker and quicker. Mm -hmm. And so the thought is that we need to be prepared uh, when that happens. So I think that, and also if we can find some other sources potentially, um, it's good to have put that on, on the table as being a, a priority. Do you think maybe you gave teachers false hope though by getting out there multiple times saying teachers should be prioritized? Do you think maybe the broader group of teachers thought this is going to happen? Well, I th well, first of all, they, 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 they know about the amount of supply we have and the demand, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. But I think that the encouraging thing for them is that it's po they're, in, they're in the po conversation now, right? They're in my conversation, they're in today's uh, presentation today. So that's, that's really progress and we'll keep on trying to find ways to accelerate that. Uh, there's been some chatter that maybe once you officially become governor, you'll have a little bit more power and you might change the prioritization in the vaccination phases and maybe put teachers a little bit further in, in front of the line. Is that something that you would consider doing once you're sworn in? Well, I think that the age and the 65, I was talking about the 65 and we're starting to talk about age 65 now. And, 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 and as you said, the geography, the, un, the, the health conditions, that makes a lot of sense because we're trying to make sure that we don't have hospitalizations and, and, and God forbid, uh, deaths. So that's, that has to be our number one priority as we try to tackle this you know, this, this enemy, this COVID-19. But I also think that the, the point is that the, the teachers to me are important. They're very important to be in the classroom. And we know it's not the only thing that will get them in the classroom. Our classrooms, you know, are historically right now shown that they've been safe, right? They're, they're, they're safer than, than uh, the most people believe. But this extra factor, I've been talking to teachers in other states that have got the vaccine and they have felt like so much weight off their shoulders that they would go into the classroom. So this is still a priority uh, on our part. And then we're meet, you know, talking to national people right now that it's a priority to them as well. So we'll see what happens. You know, I don't, I, I, in that case, I don't want to overpromise, but I think that we are working on things that will accelerate that, um, you know, the, the teachers, at least in the first K through three. Uh, you had also said that you think it's important to prioritize members of the legislature. Several members, including leadership, responded and said they shouldn't go ahead of seniors and the vulnerable. And a volunteer from your communications transition team on Twitter yesterday characterized that sentiment as cheap pandering. That's a quote. Do you agree with that? No, I don't share that. And that certainly was a, a, a tweet that was not authorized. So, you know, we're taking care of that internally. But I would say that the reason that we brought it up is that uh, other states are doing it as well. And so other states, I looked at that and I believe that the General Assembly is a priority for us on budget issues and other really important issues. So having floated the idea and then the General Assembly saying that we're okay and we can operate without, without that, you know, I accept that and, uh, and you know, we'll move on. I know you've been a big advocate for small businesses and today we learned that the state is going to lift the early closure uh, restrictions for businesses like restaurants. Uh, did you push for that? Yeah, that and I believe we're going to, you know, continue to push for incremental flexibility in all our businesses that have been asked to, uh, you know, restrict, have been restricted, you know, to keep us safe. So I think you're going to see more of that, but I think it has to all come in on the, you know, on the facts, the science. It has to really rail in, in because we, we can't 
uh, afford to have infection rates. We've got to control those. We've got to make sure the vaccines get out as quickly as we possibly can, as safely. And the hospital rate, you know, rates need to be contained because we can't have an overburden on our, on our hospitals, right? And as I mentioned before, that mortality rate, um, we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're minimizing that. But I think that we're going to have this incremental flexibility in the space. I think that the, uh, I think it was mentioned today that they're going to be able to get up to the normal operating hours in a restaurant. We're still at 33%, I believe. I think that those, those things still could be addressed based on how we make out when you look back on you know, a week or two on where we are and what ha what's the impact of that. So uh, potential that, next step could be increasing occupancy for restaurants? I think so. I think that we, I think that we should be looking at everything, talking to the, uh, as I have, right, talk to the people who are operating the businesses and get a, a, a sense on how much responsibility they want to take, all right, and then what's the trade-off for, for those, uh, you know, uh, restrictions being lifted and how we can make sure that we control the infection rate. We've heard a lot about Valentine's Day, a big night for restaurants potentially. You'll likely be sworn in as governor sometime before then. Will you take action to ease more restrictions by Valentine's Day? We're gonna look at it very quickly. And what makes common sense, we're gonna do. And what makes sense in terms of the fact that we're not gonna put people at risk, uh, and, but we look, we're gonna look at it very, very quickly. On the other side of the coin, would you be prepared to implement more restrictions if we do see another surge in cases? As a last resort, I, I think as we inch forward, I think we're smart, right? And we incrementally move the bar up and don't go from zero to 60 in, in one second, but we, we, we strategically move the businesses that have been restricted up and then take a quick look and then keep on inching them up. I think you're gonna find that many businesses are saying that they're not contributed into the infection rate and we'll find out. And if they're correct, then we'll keep on inching up that bar. I wanna to talk to you about the search for your replacement. As Lieutenant Governor, you announced a new component uh, of the search. Anyone can now submit a cover letter and resume online. How many resumes and cover letters have you gotten so far? You know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, but I've heard, I've, I've heard about a, lot, a number of names in the paper, so we're expecting uh, you know, several, and all the people that have been, you know, mentioned, uh, or, or they've made mentioned themselves, are all credible people. And so we're trying to be, you know, go through a process that makes sense, and then um, and then make a selection. You only can pick one, which is which is not a great place to be in, right? You only, you only can pick one, but uh, we'll, we'll we'll make it through the process. Is there a short list at this point? No, but I think that I think that what I've said this is people who have worked with me, uh, you know that. Because I believe that, you know, Tim, I, I believe that we've just seen why a lieutenant governor and a governor need to run together in a primary, a general election, and then manage together. So this gives us this, this window to really show why. So it's somebody who really can work with me and that, is, uh, that I feel I can work with them. I think that's a definite criteria. I think so, a level of experience, too. I don't think you pick somebody who's not experienced. And I think somebody who has a network that uh, can, is valuable uh, to the work that we're going to do, small business, education, right, the, uh, the health issues. All, those are the three major issues. And some level of um, the equity justice issue, which is at the, you know, at the top of my list. Central Falls Mayor James Diosa's name has been, or for, I should say former Central Falls Mayor James Diosa's name, has been floated several times. But we learned this week that he just took another job at Brown. So does that mean he's not in contention anymore for this position? You know, I haven't talked to James, uh, he, but I, he is a friend. And I, I, I serve on the same school board as he does, although I have to get off when I'm a mayor, the Blackstone Valley Prep Mayoral Academy. Um, so I'm not sure you know, what his intentions are. But I can tell you that we haven't made a decision. And, uh, and like you said, there are certainly people who are gonna be more um, you know, agreeable in, in terms of my, of my feelings based on that, those things I just talked about. I know you said earlier at the press briefing when you were asked about this that you'd likely make a decision on your replacement by the end of February, knowing what we know about the time frame for when the governor is likely to be confirmed and resign early February. There's going to be a couple of weeks without a lieutenant governor, sounds like? There could be. It depends on how the process goes. I mean, we want to make sure that uh, we're, we're quick but not in a hurry. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to, to having a relationship with the lieutenant governor in a way that can actually show why we should have, be running a lieutenant governor together in primaries, general elections, and then manage together uh, you know, when, you, when you actually get sworn in. 
I want to ask you about a bill that was filed. Uh, a group of progressive lawmakers in the Rhode Island House of Representatives introduced a bill that would mandate that employers give hazard pay to groups of workers that are, de that are deemed essential, like grocery store workers, for example. Would you support something like this, hazard pay for these workers? Yeah, so I haven't, I haven't seen that. And is it hazard pay for during the COVID? I, I, I'm not familiar with the bill, Kim, so it's difficult to explain. As, a, to as a general idea, would you support hazard pay for folks who have to go to work, who have to sort of be on the front lines, even if it's outside of the medical industry? Yeah, so I think that if, if there is a hazard pay in the, in the, in the, in the backdrop of the COVID, uh, that that's uh, that's an application for the the the, the CARES Act dollars, right? It, so I, I've taken that position in the nursing homes. Uh, you know, if if there is uh, legislation during the time frame that the COVID's in place and there's additional staffing, then the, you, we should be we shouldn't be putting that burden on the on the businesses. That, they're not responsible for the COVID uh, yet. So I think that the CARES Act dollars should be looked at in that respect. You have to kind of do the math though, right? Yeah, speaking of the CARES Act dollars, if we do get more federal funding, um, or even if we don't, I mean, day one, can small businesses expect Governor Dan McKee to give them some additional financial support? Yeah, so there's three things that we want to work on in that area. One is the PPP loans, where close to $2 billion was realized with, from commerce work, the SBA, our office was continually helping businesses. We need to maximize that, right? You never, never see in our lifetime again a, a, a grant that's in the form of a loan that can be forgiven in those dollars. So last time $2 billion, I think $250 million has already been, uh, you know, uh, through applications has shown. So we want to get that number really high. So that's the first thing. The other one is that we'll do a review of all the CARES Act dollars that, of 2020. The, the new statute, the new law that was passed on the, on the, uh, the stimulus by uh, President Trump extended that time frame for those $2020 into 2021. So we're gonna take a look at that and we're gonna pay particular attention to the dollars that were um, appropriated to help small business and then subtract how much were actually allocated and see what the balance is. And then we're gonna to try to make sure that those dollars uh, helped our small businesses as, as best we can. And the, and the third thing which you talked about already is really a close look at the businesses that have been restricted as opposed to the ones who are just you know, suffering because of COVID, right? Many of our businesses are suffering COVID. They haven't been really restricted. But taking a real close look at the restrictions is, would be the third thing in terms of what is practical in terms of providing some relief there. The governor has issued a flurry of executive orders during the pandemic, and she just extended many of them until February 25th, just yesterday. She re-signed some of them. Any of her executive orders that you'd consider repealing? Well, I think that it's been a long time and those, those executive orders go 30 days at a time. So I, I would have to take a look at, at them. But I do think that, uh, uh, and, uh, is that the General Assembly really plays a good, really important role. I've talked to the Senate President and the Speaker several times since that call that I got on that Thursday night from the Governor, right? And uh, you know, we're certainly going to try to engage them in, in the process as well. So I think we'll take a look at it. Many of those executive orders are very, very important. Uh, and maybe some of the other executive orders that there can be some level of agreement between us and the General Assembly leadership. Yeah, I know the governor has faced some criticism for ruling mostly through executive authority during the pandemic. It sounds like you want to change that dynamic. Well, I think that's my experience as a mayor, right? Uh, which again, this is my fifth uh, time that we've had some level of uh, you know, transition uh, while I've been in a, a chief executive. I think it's always best to work with your town council or city council when you're a mayor. I think that it's best to be working with your general assembly in a way that makes sense. And then the, a number of these things, the final call would be the governor's call, but I think that that input uh, could go a long way. I know we're running short on time here. So my final question, what's been the biggest surprise of this transition for you so far? So I think the biggest surprise, um, is that there's more press attention. So I think that that clearly is one of those surprises. So I, I, uh, I got to hone up my skills there. But uh, I think that is the, is the fact that the, the time frame. I said I, I've been involved in five, this is my fifth transition, right? The time frame here is, is on overload. So as I mentioned earlier off camera, thousand piece puzzle, we got all the pieces. Now we got to put them together in a very short period of time. So I think that there's a, certainly is a, an effort to take advantage of every single minute of the day. Um, I'll have to bring my hourglass home that I put in the office here, <laughs> where I have everybody flip it over, you know, when the hour gets up. 
and just remind everybody how valuable every hour is. So I think that that's certainly one. It's a seven day a week, hour by hour, and every hour, every minute is counting right now to make sure that we're as prepared as we possibly can when, when I get sworn in as governor. Anything else you'd like to add or let people know today? Other than the fact that uh, I want people to know that we're going to be prepared and we're going to make sure that the, 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 the health and safety of everyone is, is top. The economy is certainly one that we've talked about. And our schools, uh, we, one of the things is I think that we do have a lot of lost learning time and uh, we've got to figure out a way to help make that up for every family in the state, whether they're, regardless of their income, regardless whether they are going to a private school, public school, charter school and regardless of their you know, young boy or young girl, we, we, we really have a responsibility to them and I'm gonna pay some close attention to that with the, uh, the Commissioner of Education. Okay, I do have one last question. I know I said that was my last question, but we know that after these two years are up, you can seek two more terms. Do you see yourself being governor still in the year 2030? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna take, uh, you know, I have said that I was planning on running in, in 2022, that, though, that's not changing. Uh, and uh, we'll take, uh, this is a good uh, trial run. Uh, we're trying to, we're gonna work as hard as we can. You do, you, you do your best, Kim, and um, it's a lot of hard work to do your best. So we're gonna go out there and do our best to make sure the state is a, gets better and better in terms of the economy, the schools, and their health. Lieutenant Governor, thank you. Yes, thanks, Kim.